Hello. I am making a game. How is this possible? Well, to understand that, you have to understand studying game development has been something of a fixation of mine for years. Ever since I was a young pup, I have wanted to make games, and me discovering this site, YouTube, opened the doors to near limitless presentations on how to design games. Game design commentary, critical analysis, game balance discussion, it was a veritable smorgasbord Boy, was I fat. So I finally decided to put those skills I'd been learning, all those lessons, everything would finally be put to the ultimate test as I finally embark on the epic quest to create my very first amazingly basic and fantastic first project. That was last year. So here I am, however many months later, doing exactly that. And without further delay, let us begin. But how do we begin? Well, I think the best place to begin is in the engine I want to use. A game's engine is the toolbox used by game developers to make a game. In more professional environments, you may have more customizable and personalized engines used for your game making endeavors, like from Software's Dontelian engine and Capcom's RE engine. Obviously, I won't be using those since I don't work for From Software nor Capcom, and no, I won't be making my own. So instead, I will be using one of the big ones. Knowing what I know now, I'd highly recommend starting with Unity. It's a good all-around engine that can do a little bit of everything and even has access to visual scripting, a scripting type that makes people without a doctorate in computer sciences, me, able to make functional games. Early on, engine choice boils down to personal preference, whether you want to use one engine over another. And as such, I went with Unreal Engine. So now with our engine figured out, what am I gonna make? Well, last year I had this idea after watching a particular short that released on YouTube. The idea went something like, you are a little dude in a 3D platform, a world that is made to be bright and cheery by a sort of benevolent overlord who wants to keep you, the player, having fun. But there's a twist. A twist that I won't get into until much, much later down the line. Is it generic? Yes. Is it simple? Yes. Is it just what I need as a starter project? Absolutely. Now, why am I making this video? Simply put, views. But also because I wanted to showcase what it is I learned in about a week's worth of progress, and that as someone with no real programming knowledge, I could make something during that time. I'm sure you can too. So let's boot this thing up and uh... Uh oh. Yeah, obviously I have zero clue what I'm even looking at here. I see the level, I see some lists of things, I see a lot of buttons, but I don't know what any of them do. All right, one moment while I... So, I now know how most of these things work. But where do I start when making a game? Well, we can't exactly make a game without a player character, so that's what we're going to start with. But what is a player? Object-oriented programming is a programming model that places objects as the focus of its language. You can create objects and those objects can then be filled with code to make them do things, and this is no different with a player object. A player object is defined as a pawn by Unreal Engine, and much like a pawn in chess, it's a very basic object that has limited functionality. That is, until we give it more functionality. Let's get this thing moving. To make this object move, we need to give it inputs, those inputs being my key presses, specifically W, A, S, and D. I could always run the movement code when the key is pressed, making move forward, activate when pressing W, move left with A, and so on and so forth. But this is a bad idea, as these are called raw inputs. Raw inputs are good for system functions, like function keys in Minecraft being used for system functions. F1 hides the game's HUD, F3 shows game information like coordinates, and F5 puts you in third-person perspective. But raw inputs are bad for one reason. Players may not always like your controls, and will, as such, want to change them. So we need to employ the use of an input action. An input action is an object that searches for one or more inputs that can then be rebound later by the player. But an input action is useless by itself, as this is an object to be placed into another object, and as such, 
we need an input manager. An input manager can take multiple input actions and assign their functionality to specific game objects. In this case, our player. Let's say you have multiple player types where you want each one to control completely differently from the other. That's what an input manager is for. We then set up the player to be able to move using code that moves the pawn in the direction indicated by the input action of move. This action is set on a 2D vector which reads each input as either a positive or negative value along a certain axis of this vector. We can then retrieve this value and use it to move the player. If the value of x is 1, then move the player forward. If it's negative 1, move them back. If the value of y is 1, move them right. Negative 1 is left. Now you might be thinking, that sounds like a lot just for a bit of movement, but just remember, it could have been worse. Up next was the ability to jump. Another function easily added because Unreal Engine has jump as a major function, like how walking was. I also added a camera to the player. This camera was set on a spring arm that would squash when up against a collision object and stretch to a point when free. It also moved with the rotation value of the player object, something I would fix in day to fix the camera, I would use an input similar to the movement input, but binding controls to mouse X and mouse Y. We would then bind mouse X to the yaw of the camera and mouse Y to the pitch of the camera. And to finish it off, we need to adjust a few checkboxes so we can have the camera and player move separately. First, on the spring arm, we set use pawn control rotation to true. This makes it so when we rotate the player's pawn, it doesn't move the spring arm and the camera with the rotation of the player. Next, on the player object itself, Use controller rotation yaw. When set to true, as it is by default, the player object will rotate its yaw to face the same direction as the camera. And finally, also on the player object, orient rotation to movement. We want this to be true because it will cause the player to rotate towards the direction we move them in. During this time, I also adjusted a lot of the physics options for the player to make their jump feel a lot nicer to control. This was all in preparation for one of the primary gimmicks of the game. Earlier, I mentioned a gimmick I couldn't mention. This is not it. Here's a bit of concept art of the player character. The design has these little squares on his palms that are used to create explosions that can propel the player with the force they create, based on, and similar to, Bakugo from My Hero Academia. But how does this play out in game? Strap yourselves in, because we're about to learn about functions. Functions are a major part of any programming language, as they allow objects you've made to do specific actions. We've already seen this with the movement input and jump functions, but now, we're gonna make our own. Making a function in Unreal is simple, and it helps keep your code clean, easy to read, and in some cases, you may even want to create a function so you can reuse it multiple times. The function I made to start things off was this update blast function. I start this function by checking if the player is on the ground. If they are not, we check if the blast is active. This is set in the jump code for when the player is falling, or not on ground, and they press jump. We then check if the player has more than zero blasts. If this is also true, we also check if the blast is on a cooldown. If that is true, then do nothing. But if it's false, set the cooldown to true. Now we can launch the player upwards and forwards while removing one blast from their storage and setting a cooldown timer of 0.6 seconds. We run all this using event tick, where every tick the game is checking if this function is being used. It's also where the cooldown function is being run. So that works good, it looks good, and it feels good. What next? Well, how about... A bigger blast. The Mega Blast is essentially the same thing, but can only be used once while in the air, and consumes one of your blasts. But this blast is much bigger, meaning it's capable of carrying you much, much farther. I run a set of code extremely similar to that of the blast jump, but I'm looking for if the player is jumping and crouching, with crouching being another major function handled by the engine. When both of the is crouching and is jumping variables are true, we then run the Mega Blast code, which, on top of sending you flying, is looking for if the code is activated while on the ground. If it is, you gain a much higher Mega Blast. But if you use it in the air, you are sent much farther forward. And with that, we actually have a really effective Blast Jump gimmick that feels pretty good to control. Now, let's move on to day. Even more functions. Trust me, you're gonna have a lot of these when you make a game. This time, I made a couple different ones. Let us begin with the ledge grab. 
But to understand these next few functions, I need to bring up line traces. Have you ever wondered how your gun fires in a video game? Typically, a hitscan weapon works by a line trace. This line trace has a start and end point, and if it hits anything with a specified collision channel, it will return an out hit, which includes a variety of possible things to search for. In this case, we need the location of the out hit, which will project another line trace towards the output location. This second line returns both the location and the impact normal, which is the facing direction of the thing collided with. We then teleport the player a distance away from the location, face them towards the normal by making the impact normal value negative, disable gravity, disable movement, and now we have the ability to ledge grab. But I wasn't done because I used line traces combined with another function to create a simple attack. This another function was called a timeline. Timelines are much simpler to understand. You take a value and you set it to change over time, like this vector's rotation, which I specifically wanted to change when the player activated the attack function. And combining that with the ledge grab code, set to any visible surface while doing an in-air attack created this wall grab ability. These first few days were exceedingly productive, walking, jumping, attacking, all revolutionary features, I know, but sometimes you just need to take a step back. When making your games, you will encounter bug. And sadly, it's your job as the developer to kindly escort it out of the building. So that's a lot of what I did on day four, but also did some physics tweaks, even setting some common values for things like platforming. The player can easily jump over two meter blocks. They can blast jump over five meter blocks. They can mega blast over eight meter blocks. And the highest you can do with a single mega blast and the wall grab is 12 meters. You may be wondering how this is handy, and the answer is in level design. If you know how high the player can jump at any given time, you can easily design levels around that jump height. Plus, it's better than the 1.5389724 meter high jump of the first update. I also used my knowledge of timelines and editing variables like the true game developer I am to edit the player's friction. When you crouch, you get this neat little slide caused by a lowering of friction, and when you stand up, it slowly returns back to normal, causing you to get this slide that felt good when using a horizontal mega blast, but also unlocked tech. By doing a horizontal mega blast, crouch, jump, mega blast, crouch, jump, and so on and so forth, you move much faster than if you ended up running normally. But now we needed to to create something for the attack to function against. Introducing the nose cylinder. The nose cylinder is a lot like the player, but is a character object. This object functions like a player, but is not controlled by a controller. Instead, we need to build this thing's brain mostly from scratch. Characters come with a pawn sensing component. This pawn sensing component has a range and is capable of sensing a lot of things like visual and audio stimuli. But I just need the visual stimulus. When the player enters the range of the pawn sensing, it will run some code. This code first checks if the enemy is dead. If not, it attempts to approach the target pawn. Great, it moves now. I also gave it some idle data. When the enemy has been left idle for long enough, it will attempt to move back to its spawn point, which is information retrieved back when the thing spawns in. Now to make this thing attack the player. To do so, we need a collision box. This box is placed around the nose and is set to overlap with only pawns. You may know this as a hitbox. When this component overlaps with the player, we apply damage to them, but also launch the enemy backwards a little bit, so it has this little hit animation. Back in the player code, we make it so when the player takes damage, we reduce their health by one. If their health is at zero, we destroy the actor. If not, we set the player to invulnerable, stop their movement, and launch them upward slightly. And about 1.5 seconds later, the player will no longer be invulnerable. This is a concept known as invulnerability frames, or iframes. And it basically just prevents the player from getting hit multiple times in a row, which can be a little bit bullshit, let's be honest. I went back to the attack code and realized I had a problem. The game updates in ticks, and due to how the attack function was working, it wasn't getting a full circle of coverage. There were large gaps that enemies could easily use to their advantage. My solution was to add two more line traces, one that lags behind the central one, and one that moves in front of it. 
This fixed my coverage issue. I added a hitbox around the enemy and made sure it was larger than the enemy by a fair bit, minimizing the amount of coverage needed by the line traces once more. And I made it so that when damage is taken by the enemy, it also launches them away from the player by way of a constant. Constants are just variables that I determine before play and are static. They never change, making them constant. And the attack function is... not done. But why is it not done? Line traces. They work by projecting a single line that searches for the first thing it hits and nothing else. Considering I was running three line traces, this meant I was hitting up to three enemies. This was a problem considering I wanted to have the player fighting multiple enemies at times. This is where a multi-line trace comes in. The multi-line trace works exactly like a regular line trace, but instead of searching for just the first thing to get hit, it searches for everything it hits and outputs those things as an array. Arrays are a standard feature in C++ and are essentially a list of things. You can do a lot of things with arrays, but what I needed to do was for each hit the multi-line trace hit, it would break that hit info down into hit actors, searching for what characters were hit during the line trace, and add each unique actor hit to an array. This list would be cycled through and damage would be dealt to each enemy hit, and after it was finished, it would clear the array. If I didn't clear the array, this would cause an issue of the array constantly filling more and more, sometimes with info that isn't even present and could cause a memory leak that would slowly kill the game until it crashed. Well, with that, we now deal damage to each enemy hit, and it's all thanks to... The final day of the week was upon me, and I wanted to package this thing up. So I ran through some more bug fixes and... Uh-oh. Artificial intelligence is rather stupid. In Unreal, AI understands where it can and cannot move by way of a nav mesh. This nav mesh is created by the game and dictates where an enemy can path to. But as you can see here, well, there isn't one. But why? I actually don't know. It was present in the editor, it generated there, but for some reason it just stopped generating in front of enemies. I had a simple solution, one used by open world games. Instead of generating a massive nav mesh that is bound to create lag for your game, how about instead we generate the nav mesh around enemies? This is a feature in the project settings known as generate navigation only around navigation invokers, or in stupid person speak, aka me, it only generates the nav mesh around objects that are looking for the nav mesh. And it worked! I then worked on a few smaller things. I created a kill plane blueprint that can be dragged into a level and cause about eh, 9,999 damage to enemies when they fall into it. I added a better hit sound to the game. And I removed an enemy I spent the last two days attempting to get to function. Packaging my game, I then uploaded it to my Patreon, where at the time, anyone for as little as $1 could download it. But I want more people to help me test it, so while the initial release of each demo will be on Patreon only, after the video releases, I will be putting the Dropbox link in the description of the video. If the link doesn't work, it means there's a newer version in a future video, though I will try to keep this as up to date as possible. The next update is going to be further fleshing out the platforming elements of the game, adding interactable objects, item pickups, and a cooler test level. And finally, this is the section where the Q&A happens. I have just one comment for this video, but if you do have any questions, feel free to comment them below. From Nugget to Cat here on YouTube, will it come out on Steam when complete? Just curious. The plan is to self-publish it on Steam and itch.io. I'm not planning on having console versions at the moment, sadly. And with that one comment out of the way, I guess that's actually all for now. I know this is usually typical YouTuber stuff anyway, but if you want to help me with this project, I'd greatly appreciate your comments. Maybe subscribe if you want to see where this game goes, and if you want early access to the game demos to help bug fix and the like, you gain access to those early demos for as little as $1 only on Patreon. Oh yeah, and I also ended up updating my Discord a little bit, so you can now follow game development stuff on my Discord. Feel free to check it out. Anyways, that's all for now. Goodbye.